another Fiction Friday, reading the next chapter in the story we began last week, A Dog's Tale by Mark Twain. Today we're reading part one of chapter three. Since the chapter is long, we're breaking it up into two parts. Last week, we read both chapters one and two, and we found out that our doggy main character has a mommy who loves large words. That she doesn't understand, of course. My mommy likes large words too, and I don't always know what they mean. I try to listen my best though, because I want to please her. Then our doggy friend got adopted by a new family and left home, and they were very sad. I remember le leaving my first family and my doggy mommy and being sad too, but I went to a good home that I love and everything is great. Hopefully everything will be just as great for this dog. Let's find out, shall we? Chapter three. It was such a charming home, my new one, a fine great house with pictures and delicate decorations and rich furniture and no gloom anywhere, but all the wilderness of dainty colors lit up with flooding sunshine and the spacious grounds around it and the great garden. Oh, greenswoods and noble trees and flowers no end. And I was the same as a member of the family and they loved me and petted me and did not give me a new name, but called me by my old one that was dear to me because my mother had given it to me, Aileen Maverneen. She got it out of a song, and the Greys knew that song and said it was a beautiful name. Mrs. Gray was 30, and so sweet and so lovely you cannot imagine it. And Sadie was 10, just like her mother, just a darling, slender little copy of her with auburn tails down her back and short frocks. And the baby was a year old, and plump and dimpled, and fond of me, and could never get enough of hauling on my tail, and hugging me, and laughing out its innocent happiness. And Mr. Gray was 38, and tall and slender and handsome, a little bald in front, alert, quick in his movements, businesslike, prompt, decided, unsentimental, and with that kind of trim, chiseled face that just seems to glint and sparkle with frosty intellectuality. He was a renowned scientist. I do not know what the word means, but my mother would know how to use it and get effects. She would know how to depress a rat terrier with it and make a lap dog look sorry he came. But that is not the best one. The best one was laboratory. My mother could organize a trust on that one that would skin the tax collars off the whole herd. The laboratory was not a book or a picture or a place to wash your hands in. As the college president's dog said, no, that is the lavatory. The laboratory is quite different and is filled with jars and bottles and electrics and wires and strange machines. And every week other scientists came there and sat in the place and used the machines and discussed and made what they called experiments and discoveries. And often I came too and stood around and listened and tried to learn for the sake of my mother and in loving memory of her, although it was a pain to me as realizing what she was losing out of her life, and I gained nothing for it all. For try as I might, I was never able to make anything out of it at all. Other times I lay on the floor at the mistress's workroom and slept, she gently using me for a footstool, knowing it pleased me, for it was a caress. Other times I spent an hour in the nursery and got well tousled and made happy. Other times I watched by the crib there when the baby was asleep and the nurse out for a few minutes on the baby's affairs. And still other times I romped and raced around the grounds and in the garden with Sadie till we were tired out, then slumbered on the grass in the shade of a tree while she read her book. Other times I went visiting among the neighbor dogs for there were some most pleasant ones not far away, and one very handsome and courteous and graceful one, a curly-haired Irish setter by the name of Robin Adair, who was a Presbyterian like me and belonged to the Scotch minister. The servants in our house were all kind to me and were fond of me, and so, as you see, mine was a pleasant life. There could not be a happier dog than I was, nor a gratefuler one. I will say this for myself for it is only the truth. I tried in all the ways to do well and right and honor my mother's memory and her teachings 
and earn the happiness that had come to me as best I could. By and by came my little puppy, and then my cup was full. My happiness was perfect. It was the dearest little waddling thing, and so smooth and soft and velvety, and had such cunning little awkward paws and such affectionate eyes and such a sweet and innocent face, and it made me so proud to see how the children and their mother adored it and fondled it and exclaimed over every little wonderful thing it did. It did seem to me that life was just too lovely to... Then came the winter. One day I was standing a watch in the nursery. That, that is to say, I was asleep on the bed. The baby was asleep in the crib, which was alongside the bed, on the side next to the fireplace. It was the kind of crib that had a lofty tent over it made of gauzy stuff that you can see through. The nurse was out and we two sleepers were alone. A spark from the wood fire was shot out and it lit on the slope of the tent. I suppose a quiet interval followed. Then a scream from the baby awoke me and there was that tent flaming up towards the ceiling. Before I could think, I sprang to the floor in my fright and in a second was halfway to the door. But in the next half second, my mother's farewell was sounding in my ears and I was back on the bed again. I reached my hand through the flames and dragged the baby out by the waistband and tugged it along and we fell to the floor together in a cloud of smoke. I snatched a new hold and dragged the screaming little creature along and out the door and around the bend of the hall and was still tugging away, all excited and happy and proud, when the master's voice shouted, Be gone, you cursed beast! And I jumped to save myself, but he was furiously quick and chased me up, striking furiously at me with his cane, I dodging this way and that in terror, and at last a strong blow fell upon my left foreleg, which made me shriek and fall for the moment helpless. The cane went up for another blow, but never descended, for the nurse's voice rang wildly out, The nursery's on fire! And the master rushed away in that direction, and my other bones were saved. The pain was cruel, but no matter. I must not lose any time. He might come back at me any moment, so I limped on three legs to the other end of the hall. Well, there was a dark little stairway leading up to a garret where old boxes and such things were kept as I heard say, and where people seldom went. I managed to climb up there, and I searched my way through the dark among the piles of things, and hid in the secretest place I could find. It was foolish to be afraid there, yet still I was, so afraid that I held in and hardly even whimpered, though it would have been such a comfort to whimper, because that eases pain, you know. But I could lick my leg, and that did some good. For half an hour there was a commotion downstairs, and shoutings, and rushing footsteps, and then there was quiet again. Quiet for some minutes, and that was grateful to my spirit. For then my fears began to go down, and my fears are worse than pains. Oh, much worse. Then came a sound that froze me. They were calling me, calling me by name, hunting for me. It was muffled by distance, but that could not take the terror out of it. And it was the most dreadful sound to me that I had ever heard. It went all about, everywhere, down there, along the halls, through the rooms, in both stories, and in the basement and the cellar, then outside and farther and farther away, then back and all about the house again, and I thought it would never, never stop. But at last it did, hours and hours after the vague twilight of the garret had long ago been blotted out by black darkness. Then in that blessed stillness, my terrors fell little by little away, and I was at peace and slept. It was a good rest I had, but I awoke before the twilight had come again. I was feeling fairly comfortable, and I could think out a plan now. I made a very good one, which was to creep all the way down the back stairs and hide behind the cellar door and slip out and escape when the Iceman came at dawn while he was inside the refrigerator. Then I would hide all day and start my, on my journey when the night came. My journey to, well, anywhere that they would not know me and betray me to the master. I was feeling almost cheerful now. Then suddenly I thought, why, what would life be without my puppy? That was despair. There was no plan for me. I saw that. I must stay where I was. Stay and wait 
and take what might come. It was not my affair. That was what life is. My mother had said it. Then, well, then the calling began again. All my sorrows came back. I said to myself, the master will never forgive. I did not know what I had done to make him so bitter and unforgiving. Yet I judged it was something a dog could not understand, but which was clear to man and dreadful. And that's the end of part one of chapter three. What a wild ride. First, our dog friend, who now has the name of Eileen, is happy in her new home, just like I am happy in mine. My mommy has auburn curls like Eileen's mommy, and my daddy is a scientist of sorts too, being a doctor. I'm just like Eileen Mavernine, and my mommy and daddy kept my original name too. They loved pinecone and thought it fit me, just like the grays did for Eileen. But what a sad turn of events she encountered. First saving the baby's life, being all brave and proud, then getting scolded for it. I think the master must not have known that she was in fact saving the baby. He was scared and mistaken, and he took it out on poor Eileen. So now she is in hiding, scared to go home. So sad. I can't imagine ever being that scared to go home or having my daddy mad at me like that. Next week, we'll see what happens when Eileen's family finds her. Will they still be mad? Will they see their folly and forgive her, welcoming her home with open arms? Tune in next week to find out. And be sure to join me on Monday for another Music Monday song and Wednesday for our next wiki article. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Bye.